Hello, everybody. Welcome to International Podcast Day 2018. We are continuing our 30 plus hour live streaming event. So make sure you're out there using the hashtag International Podcast Day. I am very pleased to announce Hannah Hethman. She will be joining us and talking about podcasting the world's museum. She has a very unique uh, podcast called Museums in Strange Places. Hannah, welcome to the International Podcast Day feed. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to everyone. Absolutely. And as, as I mentioned before we started, it was I, I came across you on Twitter uh, with, with your new book that's been coming out. And I found you, your podcast and sort of the, the genre that you're in very interesting. I didn't, didn't want to deprive the international uh, podcast community about what's going on with you. So um, before we get to what you have to say, I do want to thank our 2018 International Podcast Day sponsors. You can learn more at internationalpodcastday.com slash sponsors. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, Blueberry. They are a full service podcasting company that offers uh, podcast hosting, podcast stats, and podcast advertising opportunities. You can find more at Blueberry. Dot com and our two great silver sponsors. Thank you, Repurpose.io. They actually automatically convert your audio podcast into engaging videos and upload them to YouTube, Facebook, and other social media channels. And of course, Podcast Success Academy. You can gain free access to their academy. And it's this is really cool. They teach podcasters the skills that no one told them they needed to succeed. It's a resource pack community, tutorials, workshops. Again, gain your free access at Podcast Success Academy. Dot com. Well, with that, Hannah, I will get out of your way. And we're I am definitely looking forward to learning about podcasting the world's museums, kind of sharing uh, some of the meaningful stories and the identity and culture uh, behind uh, what you've been doing. Awesome. OK, so I'll get started. Um, so as uh, as it's been said, I'm Hannah Hethman. Um, I'm an independent museum consultant focused on helping museums make better podcasts uh, on smaller budgets. <laughs> so um, I'm also the producer and the host of Museums in Strange Places, a podcast about exploring the world through its museums. And I am the author of the brand new, brand new baby book, uh, Your Museum Needs a Podcast, a step-by-step -step guide to podcasting on a budget for museums, uh, history organizations, and cultural nonprofits. Um, I am speaking to you today from Warsaw, Poland. So good morning from Poland. Um, I've been living here for about six months with my Finnish partner. Um, and uh, so I, one of the things I love about podcasting is that you can't see me, but I get to talk. Um, so I'm going to attempt now to switch over to uh, slides um, so that you can see the beautiful photos I have prepared for you. So that should have done the trick. Um, all right. So this is a silly picture of me to get started at the Shark Museum in Bjarnehup on Iceland's Snæfellsnes Peninsula, which is on the west coast. Get this all set up. Okay. Um, so if you're tweeting, just a reminder to use the hashtag International Podcast Day. Um, and feel free, please do tag me with my handle, Hannah underscore RFH. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the story of how I ended up moving to Iceland and starting a podcast about the world's museums and what it was like to podcast in Iceland. Um, I'll cover some big picture lessons I've learned from podcasting internationally, how to choose where to go, how to navigate cultural differences, and how to market an international podcast. I won't spend too much time on that, um, but I know it's something that a lot of people have questions about. Um, but I think most importantly, I want to talk about how an outsider can tell nuanced and authentic place-based stories. How can we avoid stereotypes when producing stories about places that are exotic or unfamiliar to us, um, or maybe even familiar to us, uh, as I'll talk more about later? How do you find the right stories to paint a balanced picture of a place? particularly when you aren't already familiar with it. These are some of the big questions I will try to answer in this talk today. But first, my origin story. Um, 
Oh, and I want to do a quick plug in the beginning for my book. As is mentioned, I just released Your Museum Needs a Podcast. It's on Amazon. I'll come back to that later. Um, so origin story. <laughs> in case you can't tell from my accent, I'm not Polish. I'm not Icelandic. I'm American. I was born and partly raised in the greater Washington, D.C. area, but I grew up in a traveling family. When I was a kid, we lived in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Canada. Um, and traveled all over in between before settling down for a few years once I started middle school. So here's a picture of me and my little brother in India, and the whole family loves this picture because these little girls in rural India were so excited to see his red hair, and they kept wanting to touch it. They'd never seen a little ginger kid before. <laughs> um, so after finishing my skip, skip forward way ahead into the future. And after finishing my undergraduate in English literature at the University of Maryland College Park, go Terps, I applied on a whim to the Viking and Medieval Norse Studies Master's Program at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. And to my great surprise, I got in and they accepted me. So thus began my love affair with Iceland. Over the course of two years, I learned to read Old Norse manuscripts and traveled around exploring the natural wonders of Iceland. Uh, so here's a picture of me at the site where the continental plates meet in Iceland and where one of the world's oldest parliaments was formed in the 900s. And that's my little ginger brother next to me, all grown up and not so little anymore. So after my master's in Iceland, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> back to the U.S. for a few years, and worked at a National History Museum Association. So my resume is, is really crazy. Um, and this is when I fell in love with the museum profession. I'd always loved visiting museums, and my mom took us to the museums of Washington, D.C. all the time growing up. But museums as a career never really occurred to me. But during my years in Nashville, I got to learn about the museum field and all the incredible passion and creativity found in small museums around the US. Did you know if the Americans in the audience, did you know that we have 35,000 museums in the US? That's a lot and there's so much good stuff there that it just hasn't been explored. So if you're a podcaster, I highly recommend tapping into museums. I won't, uh, I won't be upset if you tread on my territory. <laughs> so. I loved this job in Nashville, um, but uh, I, I really had itchy travel feet um, and living in the middle of the country where you can't travel as easily to Europe was uh, troubling me. And so I wanted to get back to Europe um, and to my Finnish uh, now husband who was living there. So I accepted a Fulbright fellowship to return to Iceland for the purpose of studying Icelandic, the language, um, and researching Icelandic museums. So back I went to Iceland. So why Icelandic museums or why Icelandic museums? So in doing some research, um, thinking about where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do after Nashville, I learned that Iceland, a country of 330,000 people, okay, so that's not a lot, um, has about 165 museums, which is a lot. That's a higher ratio of museums to people than almost anywhere else in the world. For some perspective, Washington DC has 200 museums and a population of nearly 700,000. So this number of museums in Iceland really excited me. But I also realized that even though I traveled around the entirety of Iceland's ring road twice while I was doing my master's degree, I'd only been to a handful of museums there and I was a museum person. So it seemed to me like the breathtaking nature was, uh, to be a little punny, stealing a little bit of the museum industry's thunder. And I wanted to find out more about this. In thinking through about how best to conduct my Fulbright research, I was gonna go and do interviews with museum professionals. I realized I should record my conversations for ease of transcription later, and then it was only a short jump from there to completely abandoning the idea of formal research, and instead deciding to create a podcast that profiled Icelandic museums and their staff. <laughs> 
uh, knowing I would only be in Iceland for nine months, I didn't want to just create a podcast about Iceland. I wanted to launch something that could go with me wherever I ended up after my grant period. I wanted to just scale. And that's how Museums in Strange Places was born. Um, from the beginning, I envisioned it as, um, from the beginning, I envisioned it as a museum about the world's podcasts with season one focusing on Iceland. The basic premise of the podcast is this. In each season, I visit a different country, state, or region and explore it through its museums. In each episode, I visit a different museum and talk to a high-level staff member about the museum's collections, programs, origin story, and whatever else is interesting. You never know what's going to come up. And it's a walking and talking podcast, which means the listener gets a lot of the sounds in the museum, um, creaky floors, curtains moving, the wind, whatever. And so they get this feeling of taking like a kind of VIP behind the scenes tour. To complete the experience for my listeners um, of visiting each museum, I bring in field recordings of the area. Um, a lot of people make field recordings of Iceland, it turns out, so this is great. Related sound effects of similar places, um, you know, maybe like birds or, or trucks going by, things that, that sound like what I had heard on site. And I incorporate at least one original track from a different local musician in each episode. Music is such a huge part of Icelandic culture and their band to population ratio is probably even crazier than museums. So I wanted to bring that aspect of their culture into my show. Um, uh, Iceland is a great place to start a podcast, actually, uh, because Icelanders are known for their storytelling abilities. They have been since the Middle Ages. Um, in the 1400s, if you were a hip and happening Norwegian king, uh, you did not have any old Norwegian telling you stories in your uh, castle. Uh, you would have gone and uh, ordered an Icelander to come because they were known for their memory and storytelling ability. And the stereotype still holds true today. So early on when I was still learning the ropes when it came to interviewing, I managed to get some incredible tape just because my subjects were so comfortable talking about themselves and their museums and telling stories. Um, sometimes it was even hard to stop them <laughs> in a good way. Um, so I, I ended up traveling to a lot of familiar and new places in Iceland to visit museums, stopping to enjoy the nature along the way. Um, so back to this picture, uh, you can see on the left, uh, this is, um, I'm standing on top of a volcano that erupted 40 years ago. Um, there's still steam coming out of the, the hole in the middle when rain started falling. And on the right, I'm standing in front of a hidden waterfall. So two highlights of my return to Iceland. And uh, I just wanted to share quickly, here are some of the incredible people I got to interview in Iceland. Um, you can see, I'm sure you noticed the punk. Um, so that's Black Elf the punk. Uh, he runs the punk museum, which is in the city's old underground uh, toilets. Um, everything to that, to contemporary art galleries. Um, we've got a woman standing in front of a coffin workshop from the local coffin maker and just all kinds of fascinating people. And I came to consider a lot of them friends as well. Okay, so by the end of this nine month um, fellowship, um, I had recorded at 21 Icelandic museums and visited another dozen. And I had developed my own little theory about museums and place-based storytelling. So place-based storytelling is really where I've kind of found my passion in the last um, two years. So I realized that museums collectively serve as autobiographies of place. So if you visited many or all of a place's museums, you'll hear which stories a people want to tell about their own history, what they want outsiders to know about them and think about them. And if you pay close attention, you'll also notice which stories aren't being told. So it's kind of like reading, again, an autobiography of a person. Um, it, in some ways, it's not gonna include everything that might be with an objective, quote unquote, outsider, right? Um, but in another way, it's their story in their own voice, which is more true in a way, in my opinion. So museums are these places all over the world, but again, in Iceland as well, that are thinking deeply about identity and culture. So if you want to understand an identity and culture of a people, 
well, museums are a really helpful place to go. So choose the right ones and you can get this nuanced look at what makes a place and people what it is. So in, in museums, you can often find out things about a people that you wouldn't know by just visiting the town and taking the sites. For example, um, these crazy photos here, I, they're just awesome. I love them. Every time I look at them, I get so excited. Um, these are photos from the Eldhamar Museum on the Westman Islands in southern Iceland. Um, and Eldhamar is the name of the volcano that uh, I was standing on in the previous picture. So it, walking around this town, Vesmaneyer in Icelandic, um, it's just adorable, colorful homes and beautiful nature and posters inviting you to go on puff and watch, puff and watching expeditions and cute gift shops. Um, and hostels and whatnot. Uh, but in the 1970s, the whole island had to evacuate for six months while a volcano poured lava over 400 homes and covered the rest of the island's thousands of homes in ash. And you can see this in the picture. It's, it was a huge event. Amazingly, no one died, but it's a dramatic moment. So this is an event that has deeply affected the identity of the people who live on the island. When speaking about recent history, the people of this island, the Eyjamen, they talk about time before the eruption and after the eruption. So something happened before the eruption or after the eruption. So, and as an outsider coming into a new place, you'll be hard pressed to find places that, that open up the triumphs, terrors, and, and preoccupations of a place better than museums. So in fact, when I was recording at this museum, I got to speak to a visitor, a local woman who had lived through the eruption and she had fled her home in the middle of the night in winter in a fishing boat while pregnant, having no idea if she'd be able to come back to her home, the first home that she was building with her husband at that time. So this is something that she told me she hadn't been able to talk about for years. It was something that her generation didn't talk about. It was really traumatic and you just moved on and lived your life. Um, but now she, because of this museum that had these pictures and these stories in an Eldhamer museum that told the story of this eruption, uh, she was able to take her family members, her younger family members there and, and talk about these stories that had been kind of repressed for many years. So it, literally this museum is the one place um, people are feeling comfortable talking with something that is so integral to their identity as, as Westman, people of the Westman Island. Um, so th that's just really interesting to me. And um, I, I like to think that I'm collecting museums, uh, just like museums collect oral histories and objects. I'm capturing these museums at this specific place and time, you know, 2017, 2018, Iceland. And I'm adding my own interpretation of the primary source with script and music, but this is just like museums do with their exhibits. They take these primary sources, oral histories, documents, photos, and then they weave a story around them and weave them together in a story that helps you understand people and have empathy for them, um, which is, is a really cool mission. I think I'm kind of trying to emulate what museums do in telling about museums. So it's kind of a, yeah, the form matches the medium. So now I want to pivot and talk about lessons learned. Um, so podcasting internationally, what have I learned? Uh, so say you want to podcast internationally. Um, this is International Podcast Day, so I'm sure there's a lot of you that are kind of like, okay, I want to get out of my town, I want to get out of my state, I want to get out of my country. I want to uh, podcast about people that are different from me, um, which if you've got that travel bug, this is something that those of us with that travel bug want. We want to meet people who are different. We want to know what other people are like, what their lives are like, what their histories are like. Um, so where do you start? How do you choose where to go? Um, so unless you're flush with cash, which I am not, and I'm guessing many of us aren't, you have to compromise and fit podcasting in where you're already going or find creative ways to get funding to go somewhere for short or long term. So, I mean, that's what I did with my Fulbright to Iceland, although the podcast idea came after uh, applying to the Fulbright. It was this way of realizing I had this unique opportunity to in my uh, case, revisit a place that I had been before. And the first time I'd been there, I kind of had this surface experience. I was with a lot of other 
um, international students. I was seeing the sites. I was taking in the, the highlights. Um, and I was really diving into the culture and the history, but on this kind of outsider um, surface level. And so I wanted to, the second time, get under that a bit and, and, and kind of look at a little closer at, at what life was really like in Iceland. And um, so I have just recorded the second season of my podcast, and I used another compromise and opportunistic moment. Um, so I did a whole second season about the Museums of Maryland, um, which is where I'm originally from, although I haven't lived there in a while. Um, so I had a wedding in Maryland and I went to podcast movement conference in Philadelphia and I realized that due to a scheduling mistake, um, I have three weeks in between with nothing to do. Um, so in nine days, nine working days, I visited 22 museums in Maryland and I have never known or learned so much about myself as a Marylander and my own state. Um, so I'll talk more about what that was like coming in as an outsider to somewhere I'm technically from. Um, but I used this time, I squeezed it in to pull out something that maybe Maryland's not as exotic as Iceland, but I think it's going to be a really cool season. And it's how I'm going to decide where to go for season three as well. I'm living in Poland now, and I originally wanted to do a big season about all of Poland, right? I wanted to really be representative. But realistically, I cannot afford to travel all over the country. It's a, it's a big country here. So I am decided just to focus in on Warsaw. And I, don't, I didn't really want to do cities, but this is what happens. If you want to podcast internationally, if you want to try new things, you have to work with the constraints you're given. Um, so, but I, I have this, I have plans to grow my abilities to visit new places for podcasts in the future. So for season four and onwards, I want to start connecting with national tourism boards and cultural funding bodies to fund my trips. Um, but I'll still need to work with countries that need that exposure. So for example, um, there are countries like uh, Dubai, these oil rich countries that are trying to build themselves as museum capitals and culture capitals of the world. It's not something they've been known for their museums in the past. Um, there's not really a museum going culture in a lot of these places, but they have like the Louvre, they'll have like Louvre satellites and Guggenheim satellites and all kinds of museums developing um, around the Middle East, really like um, Egypt just opened a huge new, big, beautiful museum in Cairo. And so reaching out to some of these people that are looking to develop their museum reputation on an international stage, I think in the future, especially as my podcast grows and I get more attention, I can leverage that to fund a two week trip to Dubai, for example, which would be pretty cool. Um, uh, so I, I'm really hoping to try something like that. Or I really also want to go to places like um, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Like no one thinks, you know where I want to go on a museum trip? Bosnia. Um, but these places have museums and they're telling really original stories and and it's it's fresh. So, um, uh, so another thing to consider is building your seasons or building your podcasting around where you're already going for conferences or doing something like that. So it's easy to pack on a few days on each end of a conference or vacations that you already have and squeeze in some recording. You may also have to work within the constraint of language. So my subjects, museums, means that it's not too hard for me to find English speaking staff members wherever I go. But if you're podcasting about another aspect of society, you may need to limit yourself to countries where English is a common second language, since otherwise you'd need to hire a translator, which is expensive, or limit yourself to the young and educated in, in certain countries where they're the people who are speaking English. I'm just looking at the questions here. Um, Kate asked, do you find the process of recording the audio interviews impact on you being an outsider? Does it change that to a feeling of inclusion as you're he hearing the stories? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. So Kate's asking if as I interview people, if I come to feel more of an insider. And this was true in both Iceland and Maryland where I had felt like an outsider, um, even though I'm from there. And so as you're connecting with these people, um, the, the microphone gives you access to people and stories that you wouldn't normally talk to. And I'm actually not a very um, outgoing person when it comes to like engaging strangers in conversation. This is like my phobia. Um, but with the podcast and with a microphone, I am kind of emboldened to ask these questions. And you really develop this rapport, especially like if you have to sit really close to people, like there's this physical connection that, that also happens. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about the connections I've made a little more later, but I would say, yeah, it's 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 a really great way to travel and get to know people, honestly. Um, I would do it even if I, uh, it's just a great way to travel. <laughs> um, so navigating, let's talk about navigating cultural differences. Um, I'm really lucky that I've never had any huge cultural misunderstandings when podcasting in Iceland. Most Icelanders speak English pretty well. So in Reykjavik, you just can assume that everyone speaks almost fluently. And, and I speak some Icelandic as well. So the language wasn't a barrier. And Icelanders are really easygoing people with almost no formality um, built into this, the social interactions. So it's, it's kind of hard to offend with over familiarity. Um, and, and Icelanders don't have last names. This is a fun thing. Um, just patronymics like Jón Jakobsson or Helga Jakobsdóttir, so you're named after your, your parent. Um, so everyone up to the president goes by their first names. Um, so side note, little, little humble brag here, thanks to my Fulbright Fellowship, I got to meet the Icelandic president and uh, participate in a group lunch with him and his Canadian wife. Um, I got to tell him about my podcast and I got to chat with him in limited Icelandic. So when you get to tell a, a world president about your podcast, I think that's a pretty, that's a highlight. So that was a highlight for me. I'm sure he didn't remember, um, but no matter, uh, I guess still was exciting for me. So this uh, informality in Iceland, combined with the fact that 98% of the country is on Facebook, um, means that the best way to get a hold of my interview subjects was often by Facebook. Uh, Icelanders are heavy Facebook users, even the older generations. I, I even got an internship the first time I was in Iceland by messaging a museum on Facebook and asking for one. Uh, so for the podcast, I often got quicker replies through Facebook than email, um, especially in cases where sometimes people didn't even respond to my email and then I'd follow up with Facebook and boom, arranged. So um, um, despite that kind of uh, informality also led to some difficulty in some ways because uh, um, it was hard to set firm times for my visit. People would tell me, oh yeah, we're, we're open all day. Just come by whenever, no big deal. Just let me know when you're close. But since I was often driving like five to seven hours uh, you know, over the weekend and visiting a few museums in one day, I needed to be a bit more precise and I had to like push for firm appointment time. And that led to some frustration, at least on my part. Um, but again, I had to just kind of remind myself that that's just not how life works there. So. Things were a little different in Maryland, but even in my own country, right? I'm American, I know how things work in America. I had to think about the best way to approach museum directors. Certain heads of museums can be emailed directly, like it's a smaller museum. And, and sometimes though, it's better to reach out to the heads of marketing or secretary, because if you look, you know, you might go, you know what, this museum, the director is not gonna answer their own email. This is gonna get ignored, right? So I'm, I'm too big, too little of a fish. So there's a little know-how and a little guesswork involved here. And I had a much more formal pitch for these US museums. I spelled out my credentials more, whereas Iceland, I could just say, hey, I'm doing a podcast. Can I come by? And they'd be like, sure. So, but in the US, I needed to spell out my credentials. It's an award-winning podcast. Um, I've got this, I've done X, I'm gonna do this. Here's how it's gonna be promoted. Here's what you'll get out of it. Um, and I often tried to identify colleagues we had in common, you know, so-and-so recommended I visit. Um, I'm familiar with your museum through this way. You know, it was highly recommended. Um, so kind of these, these connecting points to, to try and make sure that they saw my email and still a lot of people didn't respond. So I had a, a much lower success rate in getting interviews in the US, um, even with that extra layer of uh, effort. Um, I was also really careful to pay attention to when someone could, should be addressed by their first name and when an honorific like doctor should be used. So it's the useful in Iceland, everyone's first name, there's no question. But you know, in the US, anytime you're going somewhere new and talking to new people and trying to get access to places that you don't usually have access to, um, you have to be really sensitive to this because if uh, Dr. Uh, Martin is used to be calling Dr. Martin and you say, hey, Joan, can I come by? Um, they're not gonna be impressed and they're not gonna take you seriously. and they're not gonna feel like you'll respect their museum. Um, so by the way, if you're kind of wondering, uh, how would you know to address someone as their first name or doctor when reaching out, um, look at the way, for me, I look at the way they're usually talked about in other materials um, on the museum website. Um, and I see which, which form the museum uses to talk about their director. 
Um, and this can be if you're going to a business or a person or a personality, just look at how they talk about themselves and how their materials talk about themselves and, and use that method because they're going to like, because that's the way they want to be addressed. Um, so it's going to be a, a whole nother thing to podcast at museums here in Poland, um, which I'm hoping to start doing in the next month, um, because Poland is a much more formal culture and there's a lot of more formalities built into the language. And so there's a difference on how you talk formally to people you're meeting and people you know. Um, there's also going to be more of a language barrier. I've been learning Polish, but uh, only a few months. So I just know a few, a few phrases and words. And though I expect many museum professionals to know English, it's, it's not as common here and definitely not to the same level of understandability and fluency as in Iceland, um, where they had an American base outside their uh, capital for 60 years and consume more English language media. So in Poland, I'm gonna have to structure my, um, my approach differently. And I'm going to have to also structure my interviews a little differently to accommodate different levels of English familiarity. Um, this is something I only had to deal with a few times in Iceland. Um, one or two people that were um, nervous about talking in English. And so I had to be really encouraging. And it was fun that the one woman who was most terrified of speaking in English, she had this very quiet voice and she was very uh, in a heavy accent. And it was, uh, she ended up being one of the best episodes uh, that I created, which is uh, industry and nostalgia in Akareri. Um, and and it, it just, it felt more intimate, I think, because you could tell that she was being genuine. But so so this is part of the thrill of podcasting for me. It's, it's letting the needs of the podcast, like I said, pull you out of your comfort zone and into conversations and situations uh, that you would never have had without that microphone and, and trying to communicate across cultural boundaries and across international boundaries and to people, you know, that just aren't even... I personally, even in my own country, I might not talk to on a regular basis. Um, so I find this really exciting and yeah, it's just a great way to learn about the world. And hopefully I'm communicating that to the people who listen to my podcast as well, this kind of passion for understanding a place more deeply through its museums. Okay, so let's talk about avoiding stereotypes. So it can be really easy to come into a place as an outsider, accept the picture presented to tourists and run with that and other stereotypes. It, it's an easy way to talk about place, right? Paris has the Eiffel Tower and DC has the Smithsonian and Iceland has elves, but <laughs> great storytellers, I think, and great stories complicate simple narratives. And you can't tell authentic stories of place if you're just regurgitating stereotypes. You know, you're just going to be another person translating um, existing mythologies into podcast. Um, and personally, that's not what I'm here to do. So here are some of the stereotypes that I was trying to navigate in Iceland, that it's this perfect egalitarian utopia where half the population believes in elves, everyone's published a book, everyone's descended from Vikings, there's puffins flying everywhere, and everyone is quirky and happy and white. Of course, Iceland is a pretty great place, so it, I'm not saying it's not. It's uh, huge accomplishments they have in advancing human rights, gender equality, um, they're taking more refugees in the last two years per, per you know, per, relative to their population than the US by far. Um, but it's also a place full of humans, just like anywhere else. Um, there are immigrants, and so there's racism. Um, there's government corruption. This is what these protests are against here. You can see um, the city is experiencing a housing crisis that's going to lead to increased homelessness in the next few years. And for huge parts of Iceland, it was Iceland's history it was a really hard place to live. They were poor, they were under Danish rule. Um, there was not a lot of food to go around. Um, and so, um, you know, so for, for one example, though, it's one of the most gender equal countries in the world, right? Um, you may have heard that about Iceland and, and it really is, it's wonderful. Iceland still has a lot to work to do, for example, to accept and legitimize their trans community. So this is something I touched on in my episode about women's history in Iceland, where I met with the head of a women's history archive and uh, I also met with a team of academics who are creating a database of queer women's history in Iceland. So 
Um, this is kind of an example for me of how I was trying to keep a largely positive outlook. So celebrating and highlighting rather than trying to critique and investigate. So rather than pointing out what Iceland is not doing well, I would rather highlight someone who's trying to fix that problem um, in a way of letting them talk about what they think needs to happen and not me coming in and, and creating this kind of, yes, but Iceland is bad because X, Y, and Z, right? So I, I don't want to be the judge of the country either way. I just want to present a nuanced picture. So, um, so I'm trying. I was trying to keep a largely positive outlook, but again, doing so with open eyes and a more nuanced look at this complicated place. So, for me in Iceland, this um, really kind of avoiding stereotypes meant largely doing just that. So, focusing my attention on the many aspects of their history and culture that don't get as much attention. So rather than doing a season about Vikings and puffins and sweaters, I'd focus on the museums and the people that are telling aspects, uh, talking about aspects of the culture that don't, don't necessarily show up in the top 10 on TripAdvisor. So these are two pictures of Baltimore. Um, in avoiding stereotypes in Maryland, I instead, so rather than kind of just focusing on the stuff that wasn't stereotyped, I instead was seeking out the museums and museum professionals who were deconstructing these stereotypes. So the people doing the hard work and the people using their institutions to challenge assumptions and to tell a more nuanced, complicated story. So um, using my subjects to um, kind of dismantle some of those stereotypes. So and, and avoiding stereotypes in Maryland was actually even more important to me because again, it's where I'm originally from, but I never really felt uh, super connected to the place. It's part of the reason I left as soon as I could. And I haven't lived there like permanently at all for six years. Um, and, and a lot of my childhood was spent abroad. And, and when I was in Maryland, I grew up in a narrow privileged white Christian slice of the state. So an upbringing that was lovely but didn't qualify me to speak authoritatively about the state as a whole, or for example, um, talk about the black experience in Maryland. So I think Maryland doesn't have much of an international profile because it's so close to DC, um, which, which kind of high, uh, takes overshadows it a bit. But some of the stereotypes I was trying to avoid and deal with while recording were these. There's this dichotomy that some people have in their minds of in, Mar in the US of cities as where black people live and the rural areas as where the white farmers live. Uh, this is tied into narratives of how Baltimore is ghetto, dangerous, et cetera, and romantic ideas about rural white areas. Um, but as you can see from these two photos of Baltimore, and I don't know where this photo on the left is from, but it really could be like two blocks away from the other one. Um, that's how Baltimore is. Um, so, so from these stories, you can see that uh, you can choose to tell many stories about Baltimore. Um, so I could talk about, I could tell the story of dangerous Baltimore, right? A Baltimore that's so dangerous and, and blah, blah, blah. Or I could talk about the vibrant art scene, the activists who are trying to improve their city, the rich history, and so on. So you can deconstruct these judgments about the city. Um, I think by Baltimore specifically, by understanding its history and the history of institutional racism that left it as it is today, and I think that's a much more interesting story, honestly, too. So you can also uh, deconstruct the, the, the poor black people in the city, wealthy white suburbs, and honest farmers in the country mythology. Um, so in fact, the second largest county in Maryland, Prince George's County, where I'm from, is one of the richest African-American majority communities in the US. And it's almost entirely suburbs and commuter towns. Um, so this really like, you know, it doesn't jive, it doesn't fit with this uh, idea of this, you know, kind of dichotomy that is is kind of bandered around in the, um, the media a lot. Um, so we can also talk about the rural areas of Maryland were home to large plantations um, in the past run with the sweat of enslaved people and often owned by the men who ran America from DC. So there's a lot of complicating to be done. Um, the rural areas in Maryland are more likely to be victims of the opioid epidemic. Epidemic. I took a picture while I was in a more rural area of Maryland with a sign that had listed how many people had died from overdose that year. Um, so, so it's not just also this, this question of black and white, you know, Baltimore was historically the, the biggest entry point for immigrants after Ellis Island. 
And that legacy lives on in the city and the state. Um, but, but I also don't want to swing to the extreme of painting Maryland as this utopia of diversity where everyone gets along and, and there's, you know, multiculturalism when, when there's still a lot of work to be done in dismantling institutional racism. So, so there's a lot of complicated things to deal with. And I was really nervous going in. Can I, um, as an insider outsider, talk about this in, in a way that presents an authentic picture that does justice to the state? Um, that doesn't denigrate it, but but also doesn't hide its flaws. So how do, I'm gonna check the comments real quick. Cool. Um, so first things first, like how do you avoid stereotypes? Uh, and how do you paint a fair picture of a place as an outsider? I've talked about what I was trying to avoid, but but how do you actually avoid that? So you have to pick subjects that represent a more nuanced picture of a place. Seek out complex stories. Don't just pick the top 10 must-sees from TripAdvisor and go there. Be ready to bypass the must-sees for sites that tell a more nuanced picture or story of place. And from a kind of a practical standpoint, like podcasters trying to tell entertaining stories, um, top 10 places have already been covered many times, probably by at least a few podcasters. So, and, and by people with crews and equipment much nicer than yours um, and reach much farther than yours. So it's actually harder to tell really great stories, original stories about place um, uh, at places that are, are more in the spotlight. Um, and it's much easier to do it at places that are have less publicity. Plus, if you're at kind of places that are off the top 10 list or um, don't get as much uh, media attention for whatever reason, um, they, they often tell you more about, um, they're often going to spend more time with you. And, uh, you know, the big places, the top 10, actually, the top 10 often tell you more about who visits a place than what that place is actually like or those people care about. So here's a great example for me um, from my first season. Um, two episodes that I did um, on the left is the museum that is number one on TripAdvisor, the Icelandic Phallological Institute, which is the Icelandic Penis Museum. Um, and it sounds fun, it's hokey, right? And everyone goes there and everyone's asking, did you go to the penis museum? And um, I didn't really want to because I didn't really think it was, I didn't really think it was an interesting story. It's been covered by every media outlet. Like everyone's done a story about the, this museum. Um, but to popular demand, I went and I, I'm not a prude or anything, but I, um, it was really a museum of exhibitionism, honestly, and it wasn't well done. They're just kind of capitalizing on the name and a popular location to get tourists in the door and get people in the door and make them laugh a little and take their money and go. Um, so, which I said, and I, and I was comfortable saying that in my podcast was in the few negative episodes I did because I knew they had tons of publicity and I would not make a dent in their visitorship. Um, so it was a much harder story to tell because I, first of all, couldn't get um, time with a staff member. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so because I was such a small fish in all the publicity they got. Um, I, I, they didn't need me, um, so they didn't need to dedicate any staff time to me. So I took a I took an Icelandic friend, the guy who did my first episode with um, Sig, and we went. And uh, he'd never been, so we did like Icelander and Americans first impressions, and it turned out to be a great episode. I think it's really good, um, but it, it was a lot of work, and it took me about three times as long to edit as usual. Um, and 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 I don't I don't know that it it's told a story so much about Iceland as it told a story about this one particular guy and a story about, you know, perceptions of gender generally. So on the right though, is the one of my favorite visits I did in museums. So this guy is Hafstein. Um, his nickname is Steini, which in Icelandic just means stony basically. And he it kind of married into this three generation long tradition of mineral collecting. So he married into this family that had been collecting in unbelievable specimens of minerals and documenting them and cataloging them um, you know, for years and years and years and years. And he became really fascinated and decided to learn everything he could about it and asked his in-laws for permission to set up a museum. So this museum is actually in a gas station. And I just, I went because I thought that's gonna be ridiculous. Let's see what it is, a museum in a gas station, right? Um, but it's in the town of Peregeti, and the town of Peregeti has like two things. It's really small. So there's the gas station, um, the N1, and then there's this kind of like um, shopping mall type thing that has the post office, the 
um, the, the bakery, the grocery store, and a few other important uh, uh, facilities, all in one kind of little mini mini mall. Um, and so in, in a spare room off, basically, you know, think about like a convenience store. You walk in and there's candy and sodas and you pay for your gas. And to the room off to the left uh, is this kind of, you know, just a big room. And Staney has done this incredible job of building these cabinets that you see all by hand, um, raise the money to create this museum. And it's free. It's not something he's just trying to get tourists off the ring road to, to pay. He's really just passionate about telling the story of these minerals in Iceland and of his family. And so um, it's one of the best places in Iceland to learn about geology, interestingly enough. And, and he's super passionate and he's begun bringing local school children in um, to teach them about their own nature and teach them how to respect their nature. And this is something really important now with so many tourists um, coming to Iceland now. Um, they're struggling to kind of, how do we let people enjoy our, our delicate ecosystem, you know, lava and stuff without destroying it. So, so here, and, and he was so excited to show me around and help me with anything I need. Um, he let me use a song that he wrote, uh, that he sung about stones in the episode. And uh, whenever I stopped by a few times after that, going through the area, I would stop and say hi. And he's helping me with my book launch. I'm sharing it. Um, like we're Facebook friends and I feel comfortable reaching out to him. He, he invited me, thought I was still in Iceland to come talk about my book at his museum. So this is like a connection that I've made and, and someone that I, I really enjoyed. And so this was so much a better story by getting off the beaten path. You know, he doesn't make the top 10 of museums. Uh, it's really easy to bypass his museum, but it, it's, so, it's so much of a better story. So this is one of my favorite examples. Um, so, you know, these collecting, again, connecting with these less established institutions or people will allow you more access to people in charge. It gives you more room to connect with people and lay down permanent connections. Um, you know, kind of case in point, here's just some selfies with some of the people I interviewed in Maryland. Um, and I'll leave these up. These were people I really enjoyed hanging out with. Um, so how do you how do you find these stories? Um, for example, you know I had lived in Iceland for two years, so I knew the place better, and and I was from Maryland. Um, but I would say dive if you want to go to a new place and and explore stories that are not the top ten. Dive deeper than the first page of Google results. Like spend some time online, make a list of all the museums, and like check every single one of them out. That's what I did in Maryland. Rather than like looking up best museums, I found every museum, put it in a spreadsheet and looked at every single one of them and, and to see if it was worth checking out. Um, and read a book about the country, you know, to just get a little, a little something about the culture that helps you form these connections and understand where people are coming from and what stories should be told. I also was really successful in Maryland. I reached out, just kind of put a call out online. I was like, does anyone know Maryland museum professionals? And I want to talk to them. So I got a few people. I called and talked to them for 15 minutes. I asked them, what's the field like right now? What are you struggling with? What are the biggest challenges? What are people talking about? Where should I go? And then who else should I talk to? And so I ended up talking to like 10 people um, who gave me this beautiful picture kind of it, it turned into kind of word cloud. You know, there's certain museums kept coming up that I never would have thought to go to. Um, like Great Blacks and Wax is a wax museum in Baltimore dedicated to black history. And it, it's really small. I wouldn't have thought to go there otherwise. Or a Tillman's Waterman Museum, a, a tiny museum dedicated to the oral histories of watermen on the Chesapeake uh, Bay on this tiny island way off on the rural, like, eastern shore of Maryland that I never would have gone to because it took like three hours to get there. But because so many people recommended it that I was talking to, I realized it was important. And then kind of, you know, uh, wrapping up with this idea, once you find the people you want to interview, let them tell their own stories. Um, so sometimes those stories might not exactly be what you read online afterwards or beforehand. Um, so there's this kind of, you know, so, so what, what happens if they contradict facts of it? Um, I think it comes down to kind of trusting your source and doing your research and, and approaching someone and then and then letting them tell these stories, kind of considering that the, the quote unquote factually incorrect aspects may be more true to them and may be a better reflection of what um, they really feel um, rather than you know, so, so this kind of idea of what's reality. Is it the statistics or is it how they feel that it was? Um, this is going to be a way for you to let them speak above what's already the facts that are out there and get information that's original and 
Yeah, I think, and, and it allows people to trust you. If you trust them, they will trust you back. Um, so just kind of wrapping up, I know we have about five minutes left. Um, I, I'll just go quickly. If you want to have an international podcast, how do you reach your audience? How do you market? Um, connect with local culture organizers or newspapers. So when I was in Iceland, I connected with another Hannah um, who wrote for the Reykjavik Grapevines. So this is a really popular English language um, newspaper that talks about culture and goings on in the town for um, expats, locals, and um, a lot of tourists uh, read it. Um, and a lot of them pick up a free copy or look at it online and then go home and kind of follow it for years because it's just really well written. So um, I wrote a, a regular column for them on their website. Every time I released an episode, I gave them a blog post. And so I gave them a free blog post and they shared my episode with their 70,000 followers. Um, so this was huge and it gave me a huge spike in, in listeners and new subscribers that um, wouldn't necessarily have found the show otherwise. So it was a really cool way to connect with people who had visited Iceland from all over the world and really kind of expanded the international profile of my podcast. Um, and, and get your local subjects to be credible ambassadors for your podcast. You know, I'm sure, you know, when you have a guest, you ask them to promote it. Um, the cool thing for me is as I'm at institutions like museums, uh, they often have a large following online and and the small but the smaller museums if they don't have a large following they're really excited to be featured and so they'll share it with all their friends and they share it online and i just make sure that it's easy for them to share and then i thank them and i let them know how important it is and so that's why it's still like 13 percent of my listens my podcast come from iceland so people living in iceland or icelanders um so i think i've really my podcast has resonated with people in the country. I didn't just like come there, make the podcast, and then it's only listened to people in the US. Um, and then kind of outside of the place, enlist organizations that believe in the place or your mission to spread the word. So I connect with a lot of museum organizations who really believe in the power of museums. They believe that it's people should visit museums when they go to new places. And they've been really excited to share my podcast. So connecting with people that you know, if you have a kind of a worldview for your podcast, like a we believe that or this is important, connect with those people and you'll be surprised how often they want to share the podcast. So kind of on, a, on an ending note here, I want to do another plug for my book. Your Museum Needs a Podcast is on Amazon as an ebook and a, a paperback. And if you buy either one, you get a free um, audiobook and it'll be on Audible soon. Um, and then my podcast is Museums in Strange Places. It is on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get podcasts, of course. Um, I finished up season one and I'll be starting to release season two in, in, in a few months. So if you want to reach out to me, if you have questions, here's my email. My website has all my info on it, hhethman.com. And I am on Twitter and Instagram at Hannah underscore RFH. Um, and I would love to connect with you there. So um, and I know we have a few minutes, so I don't know if anyone had any questions. Um, I'm looking at the chat now, so if you have any questions or things that I didn't talk about that you'd be interested to hear, um, throw that in the questions. Um, I'd also be interested to hear, uh, since I know we have two minutes, if any of you um, have podcasted in a place that you're not, that you don't live or that you're not from, like where are you from and where did you podcast? Um, I, yeah, I'd really like to see like, how people are spreading around the world. Yeah, thank you, Hannah, for sharing that. Um, it's it's really interesting the perspective you've been given given us. And I saw there's there's some comments in the chat room. Um, oh, Steph's back. She says she's a Californian living in Shanghai. Oh, that's um, fun. Yeah, definitely fun. And I I, I love everything you shared. There, there's such a unique characteristic about your story your background and, and what you're trying to do moving forward with your different series. And I saw a couple comments, you know, it's, it's important to share the story that fits the narrative, you know, with, mm -hmm. with, with trying to balance and maneuver, you know, all, all the nuances that are within culture and within society and sort of these stereotypes and reflections of, of where you're at. And um, I, I think that comes across really clear in your presentation, and it will come across very clear in, in those that listen to your podcast as well. Great. Cool. Well, this was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so your book is out right now, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's on Amazon. Um, I, I technically was doing the release next week, but it's there. It's on, it's on Amazon. So you can pick it up. It's really cheap. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's a it's 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 technically a guide to for museums, right? But it's also just a beginner's guide to podcasting. So if there's anyone listening who wants to start a podcast or wants to do more storytelling in their podcast, I talk a lot about storytelling in the book, and I think it'd be interesting to anyone who picks it up. Yeah, I think it would be because storytelling is a big thing. It's it's part of podcasting. There there's a big push for storytelling like uh, podcast. There's there's a big consumption rate with that. And uh, it's it's really cool. So I definitely appreciate you joining us from Poland um, this morning for, for you. Um, yeah, just thank you so much. I'm really glad we were able to expose the international community to, to what you're doing. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for joining our, our feed. All right. Awesome. Well, I look forward to seeing the rest of the presentations. All right. Thanks, Anna. Bye. All right, everybody, happy International Podcast Day. Continue to go out there and use the hashtag. We will be back in about 10 minutes with, uh, with, with a new session. So thank you again.